I want to talk out loud about what I think are the differences between British bushcraft and the American equivalent, which you might say is survivalism tinged with an element of sort of frontiersman prepping. Um, now, I think in the UK, a massive arrogant element of our national character is this, this kind of sneering um, supremacy that we have towards Americans. And this idea that, you know, Americans are all crazy, they don't know anything about other cultures, they're obsessed with guns, um, they're kind of rabid, dogmatic. Um, constitutionalists who rave on about freedom and libertarianism in a way that to many Brits is, is just so kind of foreign seeming um, as to be absurd and, and deser deserving of contempt. Now I think that's that, that's an interesting thing because the absurdity of it to us actually shows us how reliant we are in the UK um, on the state and I think part of that is a function that our country is just much smaller geographically um, and that there isn't really this sense in the UK that wherever you are you're miles and miles away from human habitation and in a sense the state there's always a road or a lamppost or it's just some kind of signifier that there is a government and there is a state around or that could be called upon in a way that, not that I've been, but I'd imagine that in the wilderness of the US um, and other countries for that matter as well, with much larger, kind of more disparate geographies, I don't, I don't think you would have that same claustrophobic kind of feeling that in a, in, in a way we have here. And I'm a big believer that that that, that landscape in the, in the very literal sense, it breeds this this kind of natural statism that we, that, that we have here in the UK. And that comes out in, in debates about things like the NHS. And many Americans seem very surprised that we have this very ideological, very powerful emotive attachment to the National Health Service. Um, and that, that's a, a completely separate debate in itself. I'm not for a second suggesting I don't believe in some element of free at point of use healthcare, but what that means for us in um, in the UK is that people really are just very ignorant of not being reliant um, on the state, and I think Brexit has been a fascinating performance, I suppose, overall. And of course, there's the inevitable story in the news, which was played for laughs, which was, you know, here are the stupid kind of slightly nuts, um, patriotic um, Brexiteers who've begun prepping. And I, and I saw that story and thought, do you know what? Having a few days of food, maybe a week worth, a week's worth of non-perishable food and drink, within reason, obviously all food and drink perishes, um, enough for your family, toiletries, toilet roll, bog roll, whatever you want to call it, toothpaste, soap, drinkable water. That That's not a sort of wild fringe attitude. That's actually really pragmatic and very sensible. Um, and there isn't a huge amount of work that you need to do to be able to prepare yourself in that manner. So we're not talking about a bunker stuffed with the kind of zombie apocalypse survival <clears throat> type of scenario that you see quite a lot, um, especially on the more extreme um, American side of things. But why not just have, say, 20 litres of bottled water, some tins of food that you can eat, say some tuna salads that don't require cooking or anything like that, some calorie dense 
foods, peanut butter, oils, um, some means of purifying water, chlorination tablets. Um, it isn't it isn't as wild as it, as it sounds. So I think really the argument should be turned around towards British people to say, hey, why don't you guys take this stuff a little bit more seriously? Um, a few years ago in the London riots, uh, I was in the city at the time. I mean, as an, as an outsider sort of looking at reporting on the London riots, especially if you're an American, you, you'll get this distorted picture of, of what race relations actually are in the UK. And, and they're very different from in the US, whereas here they're, they're sort of riven more with a kind of class um, differentiator, I suppose. Um, and it's not easy to, to get the full picture of that from these kind of isolated snapshots of reporting. But in any case, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, 400 little chav, criminally minded, thuggish um, youngsters, basically, we're talking like 14 to 18 year olds, mostly, pretty much brought the city of London to a complete standstill. And, and, and you know, there was a point <clears throat> where after the riots had kind of been progressively escalating over the course of a few days, there was a point where my company, which was a small consultancy in central London, we were instructed to leave work early. So we finished work at about half three. And that was intentionally to avoid <clears throat> the kind of impending rioting that well, there were some concerns were going to happen in central London, you know, Oxford Circus, the Europe's busiest uh, pedestrian intersection. And there was a point I used to walk home from the centre of London, that was around by Waterloo, and then up through central London, Covent Garden, Soho, uh, up towards Tottenham Court Road. Um, and there was a point where, as I was just, just I'd finished work early, um, and I'm walking home, and it's quite sort of balmy, and um, I just saw, I saw two things. So first of all, I saw um, just police, just groups of police, just 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 kind of organising, and a slightly sort of chilling feeling was just seeing um, two policemen in full riot gear with a circular perspex riot shields jogging down Tottenham Court Road, which is, which is a big, um, a big uh, pedestrian sort of shopping area with, with a road through the middle, which interestingly was originally planned to be a um, extension of the M1 motorway, where some awful town planner, some kind of ideological modernist, had, had literally planned for a motorway system to, to come right into the centre of London. Um, you know, and bulldoze all the old Georgian neighbourhoods. Um, so be it. So Tottenham Court Road, you can actually see the, the width of that street was made in anticipation of that motorway in the, in the middle of, literally in the middle of central London. Um, and fortunately, that, that never occurred. We managed to hold on to some of our heritage, uh, which is always a good thing in the face of these relentless modernists. Um, and just, just as a final tangential point, very often the case that all of these town planners, designers and architects, turns out that they live in very nice Georgian townhouses. Um, what's his name? Richard Rogers, who has a property, I think, in a village in, in rural Portugal that's inaccessible by road. Well, meanwhile, every other building he makes is some kind of extruded postmodernist jumble of pipes, uh, sort of Pompidou style. So... Anyway, yeah, architects should, should be forced to live in the, the abom abominable things that they design. So, yeah, I saw the, these, these two right police jogging down the street. You know, this is broad daylight. And um, I just remember seeing that on, on the back of their body armour, it said West Midlands Police. And for anyone that's not in the UK, the West Midlands is, is hundreds of miles away from London. So the Met Police which I think is the UK's biggest police force, had obviously had to ship in or bus in all of these supporting police from around the UK 
And, and, that, and that really just gave a sense of, you know, the police do not have this under control. Um, yeah, and, and what was that, you know? 400, maybe a few more, 400 basically youths, kids who'd seen an opportunity, sense an opportunity that the political will wasn't there to enforce um, the proper policing of these riots. And, you know, these guys just went absolutely apeshit. Uh, I, I believe the UK was one or two days from having to call in the National Guard, which probably would have set a new precedent in, in the UK for that kind of thing. It's not a common occurrence to see the military on the streets in the UK, um, with the exception of Northern Ireland. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's stupid to have a degree of preparation. I do think um, the term prepping is, is a bit of a loaded term, like, like most of these phrases that get uh, popularized online. Um, and there's no need for it to be so. It, could, it, it can just be, there's a pragmatic middle ground between just being completely sheepish um, and uninterested in being self self reliant, and then the extreme kind of doomsday prepper, and that might be a straw man. I'd imagine that most people are actually quite pragmatic and 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 generally have a balanced kind of view of these things. So that's just an idea that has, has kind of come to me when you, when you walk around in in um, in Britain. You can just kind of tell that people aren't prepared for kind of anything. You know, a lot of people don't have a basic medical kit in their car or even in the house. They'll have some plasters knocking around so on, but, you know, a lot of people would be vulnerable to a power cut. Um, you know, these aren't completely unforeseeable events. So... What I kind of think of all of this is that bushcraft is, is just a wonderful phrase. And I think that's the proper orientation. It isn't survivalism or prepping. It is bushcraft. Um, you know, and what that is about is a sort of positive celebration and connection with our kind of ancestral heritage um, of woodland and landscape and plants um, and our place in, in that ecosystem. Um, and obviously part of bushcraft, uh, a sort of major thrust of bushcraft is becoming more and more resilient, I suppose. This, this kind of idealized survivalist tale that you're going to go out into the woods with your grey man backpack and MREs and uh, you know if you can get them guns and jars of bolts or whatever proto currency you think is going to replace cash you know along with all your cryptos <clears throat> um, I don't think that's really realistic and I don't, I don't think it's a healthy one uh, I think it, it's it, it's it's almost a political ideology in itself that can kind of grab hold of you like all politics. You know, all of a sudden you, you're you are this kind of negatively minded, defensively minded person that's constantly barricading yourself against society. And I personally don't want to sort of go down that route. The whole purpose of having an interest in bushcraft is basically it's it's nourishing. It's spiritually and psychologically nourishing to go outside, away from your phone, granted there's some irony here, you know, offline, away from the internet, away from politics, and just be doing something in a natural environment or as natural as you can find it, which crucially is, is, isn't it isn't a means to an end. It's an end in itself. And for me, that's, that's one of the central um, 
the central kind of qualities, I suppose, of all this, which is, yeah, it's, it's fun to buy all of this kit and, and gradually kind of build up this iter iterative collection of, you know, kit that can help you survive. It's fun, it's masculine. Becoming yourself sovereign, someone that can govern themselves, you know, and everybody else is falling apart and you crack out your your fishing line and your fire kit and get things going and build a sort of mini civilization. This is this is awesome stuff. Um but it's it's also doing something that isn't transactional and consumptive in nature. And I don't mean in nature in the sense of around nature, I mean in terms of category. So almost everything that we do now, um, for some time now, is basically tra a transactional exchange, usually of monetary value. Um, and th th this, this, is, this is another kind of driving impetus to take up the practice of bushcraft and it is, a, it is a practice now you know I'm a long way off from any of the guys who've been doing this stuff for years and years and years especially um, ex-military or people who are I suppose woodsmen and you know they are stewards of the natural landscape in, in their day-to-day -day job I'm a long way off doing any of that. Um, all the more reason for me to, to 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 look around and say, that's precisely why I need to step away from this constantly transactional lifestyle, which becomes default setting pretty much for everybody um, who has a job, buys stuff, buys things on Amazon. Yeah, and. I got to a point the other week where I thought, hang on a minute, a lot, a lot of what I'm doing for this, this kind of project of bushcraft is, is turning into just buying more and more things, looking on Amazon for the next thing to buy. Um, so it's really important just to put paid to that and actually just get started. It can be simple, it can be small. I set myself a, a silly little challenge of just taking out my bag, a day bag, 25 litre rucksack, pretty inconspicuous. Um, it's nothing military or kind of mole spec, or molly or mole? Some, somebody needs to explain this to me. Let's go with um, mole. So there's, there's nothing like that. It's just an inconspicuous bag. And the first kind of mission, the barrier I suppose from not doing bushcraft to actually starting was just to walk around the park by myself, with my bag, full of kit, had a knife in. Uh, that is also a separate topic if you're in the UK and I'll have to discuss that separately. But yeah, just that feeling of like, right, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not even out of the city. I'm still in a park, but it, my mindset is starting to orient towards these 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 little challenges of bushcraft, you know, what would I do if it started raining? And for example, I did have to stay here for the next 24 hours. Um, how, how could I cook something? And that's, that's the practice. It's the practice that leads you to the proper kind of questions um, and the kind of route that you need to follow. So I was just down in uh, West Wales on a lovely stretch of coastline a couple of weeks ago with with my um my brother and um my mum and my brother's girlfriend and um you know we got we got a fire going this time we got the D Dakota fire hole on the go which is just quality um you know pretty basic thing for for everybody who's used to this sort of stuff but just just a good fun kind of next step um, made some little tweaks to help reduce the smoke, um, direct the direction of the smoke. But then the the obvious sticking point was I didn't actually have anything to cook anything with. So um, I've corrected that and added my Stanley cook set. 
And the next little challenge is simply to go outside, boil some water, uh, and make a hot chocolate. So those were just some thoughts that I have about not so much the how or what of bushcraft, but re really the why. Why are, why are we doing all of this stuff? Um, and what's it for? So I hope you found that interesting. And I'll be posting more and more videos as I start to complete and just get stuck into all these nice challenges. Um, I'm looking at some trees to do a bit of climbing. So hopefully we'll get some good footage of that. Yeah, and uh, it's a good thing. If, you, if you're if you watching this and you think, oh, well, you know, I would kind of like to do that, but I'm busy and I've got my job and my family and my kids. You won't regret it to get started. Just start small. You don't need to be Bear Grylls or some kind of special forces survivalist. You just need to get started.